morning, everyone. I want to uh, read you a short passage from Jeremiah. This is our third week in uh, Jeremiah. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at Jeremiah's call and talked about how all of us, if we're listening, God whispers and calls us. Uh, last week, we talked about how God has a plan for us. We do believe God has a plan for us. How? And how detailed is it? Do we have to micromanage or we're outside of God's will? No. If we st- stay loving God uh, and let him direct us in the big things of our life, in our values and the way we live, we can be within God's plan. So today we're into the third part of Jeremiah. This is a long way through. He's been trying to tell the people of Jerusalem that God's plan was for them to stay with God and stay godly. And they drifted away. And now they've been captured, carried off into captivity in Babylon. So let's just look at the uh, scripture and what Jeremiah says. This is a different translation than we normally use. This is from the message, and it really brings it out, I think, in clarity. This is the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to what was left of the elders among the exiles, to the priests and prophets and all the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem, including King Jehoiakim, the queen mother, the government leaders, all the skilled laborers and craftsmen. They're all in Babylon, in captivity. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. He writes over to them, and he says, Build houses there. Make yourselves at home. Put in gardens and eat what grows in that country. Marry and have children. Encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for that country's welfare. My emphasis there. Pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things will go well for you. Great, great letter. I think there's a whole bunch of things in that that we can learn, and we're going to unpack that in a little bit. Um, I titled my, <clears throat> my message this morning, Exile on Main Street. Those of you who are of a certain age might recognize that title. Hands up if you do. Oh, good, okay. Um, it comes from uh, Mick and Keith and Charlie and the boys who got it right in the south of France back in the summer of 72. You can figure out what I just said. Um, This is one of those, this is one of those mornings the message intrigued me and invigorated me as the week progressed. I, I was eager to get here and talk to you about Jeremiah and this scripture. Once in a while, occasionally, it's the opposite. I'm hesitant and I'm struggling, and you probably know those Sundays. But most times, and especially with scriptures like this, I eagerly anticipate getting up here and unpacking what I think are incredibly valuable ideas. Jeremiah, what a guy. Lived 600 years before Jesus tried to talk his people back toward God and godly living, but failed. And by the scripture we're reading today from chapter 29, Jerusalem has been leveled, its people, its leading citizens carried off to Babylon to live in captive exile. So how to carry on, how to live as God's people in a foreign land, in an alien culture, in a strange city. Conventional wisdom would be to remain apart, isolated, have as little to do as possible with your captors, withdraw, keep to yourself, wall yourself in, so to speak, and practice your particular customs, your language, your rituals, your religion, in isolation from the threat of the alien in Babylon. That would be conventional wisdom. But the, ali- the 
exiled community receives a surprising bit of advice. They get this letter from Jeremiah back in Jerusalem, and this is what he advises. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and husbands. Have children and grandchildren. In other words, settle in, live there, be part of the community. And then this surprising advice, not just settle in and live, but wish the best and pray for the best for your captors. Seek the welfare. Pray to the Lord. For in Babylon's welfare, you will find your welfare. I liked the earlier translation I read because it says your well-being is in their well-being. This is all counterintuitive, however. It goes against the grain of normal thinking of captives in enemy territory. But there it is, a word from the Lord to God's ancient people. What can we take from it? Honestly, I got excited about this, and we talked about it in the planning team and came up with a whole bunch of things, and I found more after, but I'm going to limit myself to four. And John has four bullet points he's going to roll out for us. Here's the first one. In the midst of disaster and trauma, there's a message of hope and a way forward. And that is always valuable. This week was the 50th anniversary of the assassination of JFK in Dallas. And it triggered a reflective discussion I had with several colleagues. Commentators, all of the analysts, historians now say that it was such a traumatic event, JFK's assassination, followed by a series of traumatic events through the 60s, the Vietnam War and several other uh, assassinations, the whole cultural mindset actually changed, especially in America, but even worldwide. Hope was lost, a despondent despair set in to many people. One of the group I was with told of his brother, an American, a teacher in a a predominantly black area of Cleveland. After the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., which was the second big murder in American culture, after King was killed, this white teacher had black parents coming to the school and saying to him in absolute despair, can you do something to help our children? They've given up. The black kids had given up. And that's why there were riots. And that's why there was such trauma throughout their whole ethnic culture. I think I understand. And I think Jeremiah would understand. And Jeremiah would know what to say. He gives very practical, helpful advice to these captives in Babylon who've experienced this terrible trauma. He says, build, plant, marry. When struggling, suffering, discouraged, do something, anything you can, positive. Jeremiah wrote to the captives in Babylon instructing them to move ahead with their lives. Life cannot grind to a halt during troubled times. So here's the question we have to ask ourselves. When has your world shifted? And you, you just didn't know where you were anymore. When in your life has something hit you so traumatic that you were disoriented, you felt like a foreigner, you did not know where you were or what to do in life? When you enter times of trouble or sudden change, Jeremiah is saying, pray diligently and move ahead, doing whatever you can, rather than giving up because of uncertainty. A little bit of progress, some task accomplished. 
some little success can give us hope and restore the spirit and renew our energy. I could do a whole sermon on that, but I'm going to leave it there. That's lesson number one out of this scripture. Number two, here's something else. Forgive and pray blessing on those you've disagreed with. Now, we talk about this regularly around here. It's part of a Christian lifestyle. This week, I was in Hamilton uh, and attended the YMCA's Peace Medal Breakfast. The guest speaker was a young man from South Sudan, Africa. He'd been kidnapped as a seven-year-old by one of the warring factions, and he had been forced to be a child soldier. He carried a rifle. For almost a decade, he carried a rifle that was taller than him. Seven-year-old, he's about this high. They gave him an AK-47 that was that high. And he had to, for 10 years, be part of the struggle. Eventually, he was freed. And his life has been largely restored. But he'd lost all his family and went through... Someone asked him, in one word, could you sum up your time? And he said, hell. That was the one word. Hell was where he was for a decade, from 7 to 17. Finally rescued, his life is now on track. And he he goes from Britain all through North America using music and advocacy for peace to restore He's forgiven his captors and left behind. He's just put it behind him. And he said this to us. When you hold on to hating someone, it's like swallowing poison and hoping that it kills your enemy. Yeah. I was sitting there and just went, wow. And I grabbed a pen and wrote that down. And again, Jeremiah's prophetic letter to the exile seems to understand this. He advises them to, quote, work for the peace and prosperity of Babylon, verse 7. Now, what you need to know is that's a new theological concept. This is the first time we know in the Bible, 600 B.C., when God's people suddenly got it, that God doesn't want us to destroy our enemies. You know that until then, they slew the Amalekites and wiped out the Jebusites and destroyed the Hittites and etc., etc. But here, Jeremiah says, pray for the welfare of. Ask God to bless them. That's a great truth, always worth living by. And Jeremiah is 600 years before Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus made this really clear. What did he say? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So often, in practice, in reality, people hate their government. They complain about business. They harbor conflicts between siblings and in-laws. But this great truth to learn is forgive and pray blessing on those you've disagreed with. Don Henley of the Eagles got it right. You better put it all behind you because life goes on. You keep carrying that anger. It'll eat you up inside. That was two. Third message in this Jeremiah passage. It's about living as strangers in a foreign land. I call it resident aliens. If you are a Christ follower, you need to recognize you're increasingly in the minority. In our adult lifetime, the North American church, as one historian put it, the North American church has lost its home court advantage. The world we once dominated was lost to the forces of secularity. Gallup polls findings. Let me just read you some stats and go across the decades with me. 1952, Gallup found 6% of American adults had no religious training. Okay, 1952. Before I was born, 6%. 1950, 
No religious training. Stop. Just leave it alone. 1965. Okay, I'm born now. The figure is 9%. It's gone from 6% to 9%. 1978, I'm a teenager, it's 17%. By the turn of the century, it was one-third, 33%. And today, nearly 50% of all teenage and adult Canadians have no religious training in their background. Less than 20% of the population are actually in church or a synagogue or a mosque, are actually practicing their religion. I mean, you hear all kinds of people say, uh, I'm non-practicing Catholic, all right, non-practicing whatever. Less than 20% of the population are actually in church, mosque, or synagogue now. Many of us grew up thinking we lived in a Christian society. Do you think that's the case today? We still have, our legal system still has many Christian values. That's a different question. Are we a Christian society? Consciously living as disciples of Jesus? Not the majority anymore. When you came to church this morning, you are definitely a minority of those in your neighborhood. Being a Christian is no longer the normal thing to do. You're weird. But it's not panic button time. For any committed Christ followers, we have some serious thinking and evaluating to do. Let me read you a quote from a prof at Columbia University. Reflective Christians find themselves increasingly at odds with the dominant values of consumer capitalism and the entertainment leisure-driven culture. There's no easy or obvious way to hold together core faith claims and this consumer capitalism, entertainment leisure, social reality around us. Reflective Christians are increasingly resident aliens. So what do you do in a situation like that? Do you get all judgmental and be defiant? Do you get aloofly critical? Do we clench our fists, hunker down, build walls, monitor the music our kids are listening to and singing, refuse to learn the language, keep ourselves untainted by Babylon all around us? No. Says Jeremiah, you make the best of it. You acknowledge that you're in a strange land. It's different than where you were. You realize however, that something's at stake with the way you spend your time and spend your money and what you do with your family and what you watch on TV and even the clothes you wear and how much you spend on them and on and on and on. But you also do what Jeremiah says. You pray for the peace and the welfare of this city and the culture around you worship, you pray for those who, you pray for those who don't worship the God you do, or any God other than luxury and leisure, which is more and more the majority of our culture. You realize that this is the world to which God has called you, and you try to live in this world, this world with all its ambiguity and its many challenges. You live here as best you can and as graciously as you can. That's what resident aliens and exiles on Main Street do. And it will at times make you seem a little different, even weird, maybe a little countercultural. I got inspired about that with a tiny incident this week. I was with a small group of pastors, as I said earlier, and Billy Graham came up. Billy is 95 now. He's winding down. Well, he is. He gave his last message. I don't know if any of you saw that, but it was kind of announced. This is the last public message he'll, he'll give. The, the group I was in, we were uh, given a copy of his last book. 
the reason for my hope. And I'll loan this. I've got a couple of copies of it. They gave us extras. If anybody wants to borrow it. The little group I was in, we talked about Billy and how he has lived with such integrity and faithfulness. And as you know, not all religious leaders have. Not all televangelists have. But Billy and his team set themselves to high, high standards of conduct in their finances, in their personal lives and their relationships. One of the things they decided 60-some years ago was that he and his team, none of them would ever be alone in a room other than with their wife. Not because Billy didn't trust anyone, or including himself, but just to avoid any possibility of misunderstanding or of tension. The goal was integrity that was unquestioned. And Billy and his team would not even step onto an elevator alone with another woman, just to make sure they never had the possibility of creating a, a misimpression or tension or anything. So we're talking about this, and one of the pastors, a young guy here in town, I almost wanted to say his name and what church, but I'll just say if you drive up Guelph Line, you go by his church. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> um, he said to us, he's tried to live by the same guidelines. If he's in his office, he does not close the door if he's alone with a woman other than his wife. He, he just doesn't want to ever cause tension in anyone else or a misimpression. And he said, some might say that's weird, but I'm okay with that. It's an integrity beyond the norm. And for Jesus' followers, that's okay. Jesus' followers ought to be seen as a little bit different, unique, maybe even weird. However, we want to live like Jesus without being judgmental or aloof. You see the fine line and the, what I'm talking about? There's always been within the Christian tradition the suspicion that this world is fallen, corrupt, a sinful place, and the purpose of religion is to deliver us from this fallen, sinful world and get us to go to heaven. And so we separate ourselves. Come apart, that tradition tells us. Keep yourself clean and undefiled by the dirt and grime of real human life. It's always been a temptation for Christian people and Christian churches to turn away from the world and the society where all that was wrong and fallen and sinful, we thought, is on display. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't do that. And Jeremiah didn't call for that. The simple fact is, Jesus not only lived thoroughly in the world, but apparently loved the world very much. The simple fact is, he spent much, if not most, of his time with people whose needs were urgent and worldly, sick people, outcast people because of their morality or their lifestyle, poor people, hungry people. Jesus chose to come to the broken world, lost and wandering, and he wept over it. He lamented for it. That ought to be us. We're called to that. In fact, a spirituality based on Jesus finds its depth in intentional involvement in the world. We don't withdraw from, we give ourselves to the world. So, it's okay to be unique, different, resident aliens while continuing to love and live in the world that God loves and Jesus died for. That's what we're about. N.T. Wright, as you know, is one of my heroes in his book, Simply Christian. 
Wright says, the purpose of the church is not merely to get us to a better place when we die. Quote, we're called here and now to be instruments of God's new creation, which has already been launched in Jesus, and of which Jesus' followers are supposed to be its agents. What's that new creation? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's what we're about. And we do that as Jesus did. We don't pull back. We don't judge and trash. We just love, as Jesus did, with our lives. Jeremiah knew what he was talking about. 600 years before Christ. He's worth a read. We'll look at him one more Sunday next week. Be our last Sunday, and then we'll be into December and Christmas. Let me pray. Holy One, in some ways we're resident aliens, in some ways we're exiles on Main Street, but it's a Main Street that you love. This is your city, this is your land, this is your world. Holy One, we join you and we live like you for the good of your world. Amen. Amen. Let me offer this blessing. Send us back into your world. Send us back not feeling too alien, Lord, but feeling joyful about our discipleship and our opportunity to witness and love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen.